Welcome to the National Press Foundation. We're coming to you from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios. I'm Chris Adams, Director of Training for NPF. Today, we're looking at vaccine hesitancy, vaccine misinformation, and how journalists can explore them. Since nurse Sandra Lindsay was the first person in the US to receive a vaccine outside of a clinical trial, the nation has made dramatic gains in this unprecedented effort. But the easy work has been done. We'll share two new tools from Google that will help journalists understand how people are processing vaccine information or misinformation, and also where it's relatively harder to access the vaccine. We're here today to talk about vaccine hesitancy, vaccine misinformation, and how journalists can explore them. We'll be introducing two new tools from Google that can help the public and the media do so. Our guests are Tomer Shekel, a senior product manager for Google Health, who helped develop the COVID-19 vaccine search insights tool. He's coming to us today from Israel, so thanks very much for staying up late to be with us. Dr. Georges Benjamin is executive director of the American Public Health Association and one of the nation's most sought after experts on vaccine hesitancy. And Dr. Rebecca Weintraub is an assistant professor of global health and social medicine at the Harvard Medical School and director of better evidence for the Ariadne Labs. She helped build the vaccine equity planner tool we'll be discussing. We'll hear from each of the panelists and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. You can raise your Zoom hand or put a question into the Q&A text function. And please tweet today at hashtag NPF vaccine. So welcome to all. I'd like to thank you for coming, for joining with us today. We have uh, reporters from around the country and around the globe on the call today. So we'll get to questions from them when they come in and, and at the end of the program um, or at the end of the panelist. Uh, but for, for starters, I'd like to turn to Dr. Benjamin. Um, Dr. Benjamin, I was hoping you could just give us, set the stage for where, where the country is right now on the vaccination effort. Why have we seen the numbers kind of, you know, stall out a bit? And when it comes to vaccine hesitancy and vaccine misinformation, I mean, what are the most important things for us to know right now about what's going on? Well, thank you, Chris. And, and let me just say that, um, if you think about the fact that this has been a remarkable um, development of science, um, even though it started literally over 15 years ago when we started looking at vaccines for SARS uh, COVID 1, and it's been a remarkable activity. In 10 months, we were able to go from concept to um, a usable vaccine, which is highly safe and highly effective. Um, once SARS COVID 2, um, um, Actually, actually hit the stage. Today we have in the United States um, about 184 million people who have had one shot. That's about 65% of the population and about almost 160 million people who've been fully vaccinated. It's about 56% of the population. And again, in the, in the time that period that we've been doing this, in, in, in essence, December, uh, this is a remarkable number of people to get vaccinated. Having said that, we have seen that there are many people out there that do not have the confidence to get vaccinated. Uh, we still have people that fall into a range of spectrum. So it's important to understand that getting a vaccine is, uh, and people's um, decision to do so is a spectrum of, of people's thoughts about being vaccinated from early adopters um, who are very comfortable with the process and very comfortable with vaccines and understand their benefit uh, to people who are highly, highly suspect and, and quite frankly, are not going to get vaccinated, most likely no matter what we do. Turns out that group of, of people who are, are so highly skeptical, it is highly unlikely they're going to get vaccinated. And most of the surveys that are done, um, it's in the 12 to 14% range. Uh, and then everyone else between that is, 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 is movable. There are people, again, who are late adopters because it's a new vaccine, one of wait and see uh, what happens. They wanna see, they don't wanna be first, they're willing to get it, but they don't wanna be first. And then we have people who, for whom need more information and people who are concerned very much about um, long-term um, comp complications from the vaccine. And I remind you that this vaccine is at best uh, a year um, and a half old. So it's not been around that long. Having said that, um, you know, obviously millions and millions of people worldwide have had the vaccine and, and we've used various platforms to produce this vaccine. 
I think the real issue around hesitancy and the reason that people um, don't have the full confidence, number one, is the fact that this vaccine has been debated and developed in a fishbowl. So the kinds of things that scientists normally do behind the scenes and the debates that we normally have, um, the public normally doesn't see that. So with that exposure, um, all of the debate um, has brought some of people's concerns, but even the scientists' concerns to light. So people just don't have all the information that they need. And even when they have a lot of information, um, trust has been an issue. So for some communities, particularly communities of color, trust remains an issue. Um, historical injustices, the fact that they don't trust the health system fundamentally, the fact that they um, may not be sure about what the vaccine does um, has been a big issue. We have issues around misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation, of course, is when people share information that's not correct. And disinformation is when they do that, but for a, a nefarious purpose. And we've had people that have basically given disinformation with the intent of dissuading people from getting vaccines, a range of motives um, in doing that. And so people are having, in many cases, difficulty sorting that. Um, let me finally say that today, um, we have probably vaccinated all of the early adopters for sure. We've, we've vaccinated a lot of people who um, have had some early reluctance to be vaccinated, but have developed vaccine confidence. And right now we have a population of people, which includes people who have said, absolutely not. Again, relatively small amount of people, people who still need more information and still people who um, have some disinformation. And then there's probably a large percentage of the people that are unvaccinated who just interestingly enough have not gotten around to it. And that's a population that might be persuaded by making it easier for them to get vaccinated, removing some of the barriers, that's the structural barriers that we have, and um, maybe even might be moved by incentives. Okay, I wanna get a couple of those issues and we'll touch on um, in a bit with uh, Tomer and with Rebecca Weintraub, uh, particularly the misinformation and disinformation and the, the ease of access. I do want to ask a couple of follow-up questions here. Um, one is you mentioned you mentioned you know some pockets of resistance or hesitancy. One of those being uh, communities of color, and that was due to access problems and historical distrust of the medical system. Another pocket has been ideological: Republicans aligned with President Trump and hostile to public health directives in general. Um, you know those have been concerns since this this effort started. Has the country made any made any progress on kind of reaching those two groups? And are those are those the two yeah. main pockets of hesitancy? So, with the African American community, uh, there has been there's been substantial progress in terms of getting um, more confidence in the vaccine. And particularly this last month, we've seen a greater uptake uh, in the African American community because there's been an effort to let the community know that there are lots of African-Americans and other um, minorities that have been in the studies. And that, you know, historically getting minorities, particularly African-Americans in research studies has been a dismal failure, but not with this one. There's been a, a, a Herculean effort to get people to more accurately represent the percent of people in the population. Secondly, there has been a effort to get the right message to people and to use the right messengers. So we know that, for example, your physician and your nurse are much more likely to be a trusted messenger. Uh, religious leaders are much more likely to be a trusted messengers, uh, particularly in the African-American community and in the Hispanic community, uh, which also had some disparities, um, certainly making sure that the information is communicated in, the, in, um, in Spanish and in languages that um, for people whose English is not their first language has been a, been a, a great effort. In the last 30 days with the Biden big push to get uh, um, most adults, up to 70% of adults vaccinated by July 4th, they didn't meet, meet that target. Uh, they got somewhere as close to 67%, but uh, there was a, a huge closure of the gap for African-Americans. Uh, we went from somewhere around 6% of African-Americans being vaccinated 
during that time period to get 9%. And of course, African Americans about 12% of the population. So there was an effort. Hispanic community took off very well. The evangelical community, um, Trump voters, they're still getting a lot of negative messages from the media in which they primarily listen. Uh, but what we've discovered, and Frank Lutz has done some work here with some of his survey work, if you can sit down with that population in a thoughtful way and give them the information uh, in an unbiased way and build trust, you can get conservative communities vaccinated. But you know, there was a third population you did miss, mention, and that was the young people. The problem we have with young people is that we told them very early on that they were at low risk and um, they weren't prioritized early on. And so the, now that grandma's vaccinated, <coughs> their, um, the motivation to be vaccinated to protect grandma is no longer there. And they don't necessarily see themselves at risk. And that, of course, debate was during the wild type virus, the original virus. The new Delta variant, which is now the predominant variant, is highly infectious and is preying on not just um, anyone who's unvaccinated, and that includes the young people that we have. Okay, I want to pull up a map of a map that many people have seen of the you know vaccination status by state on this particular coding color scheme. The uh, the yellow and and the light green are the ones the states that are behind. Then the dark green states are ahead. You know, I think Vermont is 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 above Vermont is above seventy, and some of the southern states are well below 50. My question for you, uh, Dr. Benjamin, is the Southern states particularly, they seem to have two of the pockets. They have both, they're, they're red states with very conservative voters, but they also have significant African-American communities. Um, what, what is the, you know, describe for me what, you, you know, your colleagues in the public health community in those Southern states, I mean, how do they how do they try to most effectively reach as many people as they can? Do they have to have basically two different messaging streams going out? Yeah, you know, we're, we're at the point we have to do this ground game. This is about basically shoe lever epidemiology and public health. You've got to go into communities, bang on doors. Um, you have to talk to people in the communities. You have to make sure the vaccination is in those communities. Um, mass vaccination sites, broad public broadcasting, works for the early adopters and people who um, have some degree of, of vaccine um, concerns. But when you wanna to get to people who are underserved and people who have a great deal of concerns, you absolutely have to um, do this, you know, this old fashioned public health where we go into communities to engage them where they are by tr using trusted messengers. Uh, one of the things that the folks at the University of Maryland are doing um, is using barbers um, because barbers turns out to be trusted messengers. We used them a lot during the early part of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Community health workers who know the community, you know, they, they're trusted. They're already trusted. They've been going to those communities to deal with substance abuse issues, mental health issues, infant mortality issues. So when they go to a community and say, look, um, vaccine is okay, it's safe, it's effective, you ought to get your shot. Um, they're much more likely to um, get the individuals to comply. The other thing you find in the South is that their infrastructure issues, their social determinative issues are real. Um, most very rural, difficult to get to, transportation is a problem. The, the health systems um, are an issue. Um, many of these communities have not expanded their program for the Medicaid program. They also align very much in those states that already are at the bottom for when we rank states in terms of healthcare outcomes. So fundamentally, they're not doing as well as the rest of the nation in terms of their health outcomes. And so why should we be surprised that they're any different in terms of, of, uh, of COVID? Um, but the truth is that if we don't get them vaccinated, they're much more likely with this highly infectious variant um, to, to have a higher morbidity and mortality. So it's gonna take a lot more work to get them, to get them focused. Okay, and I, I, we have one question here. I want to go to Dr. Benjamin, and then we'll move on to Tomer Sheckel. But this is from Ann Seiker uh, from the Cincinnati Inquirer, a former NPF fellow of ours. For Dr. Benjamin, should doctors make personal phone calls to their patients who have not been vaccinated? Absolutely. Um, you know, um, it works. And talking to your patients, sending them a letter, calling them, texting them, 
um, engaging them, um, I absolutely, um, you have a relationship with them and um, physicians should first of all, get vaccinated themselves, make sure all the people in their office are vaccinated uh, and then encourage their patients to get vaccinated. No question about it. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Benjamin. We'll be back to you with, with some more questions in a bit, but now let's uh, uh, go to Tomer Shekel, um, who is with Google Health and developed a tool called the vaccine, uh, the COVID Search Insights tool. And I was hoping you could tell us, uh, for starters, you know, what was your motivation at Google Health for developing this tool? And then give us a sense of, of you know, what, what the methods are, what the data are, and then, then, then we'll have you demonstrate it for us. Yeah, of course. Um, so first, let me just say maybe on our team a bit. So our team is part of a group called Google Health. And our specific team is really focusing on supporting public health efforts, but in a non-commercial way. So all the tools that we are building capabilities are free, public, and available for everyone to use. Uh, so specifically, our team is focusing on how can we use Google unique assets and, and capabilities to support public health decision-making, uh, being data that is unique, uh, to, to really help inform those decisions. Um, for example, early in the pandemic, we uh, had a project that, you know, we know that many reporters and public health officials were using around community mobility efforts that was trying to assess changes in mobility as social distancing measures were introduced and policies were introduced. So now in Q4, uh, Q4 2020, we knew the vaccination is probably coming and we started thinking, how can we support this upcoming effort? Clearly it's a massive effort in the US and globally. And we went and actually talked to public health officials at the local level, you know, counties, cities, state level, to understand um, what, what do they need, what gaps do they have. So maybe we, or maybe Google as a whole, would be able to support their efforts. And of course, all those conversations, we talked to many uh, officials, researchers in the vaccine confidence space. We had like one clear need again and again, and that was to really understand their community's information needs and concerns regarding the COVID-19 vaccination and how they'll change over time. Why is that important for them? So that can really help them uh, inform the efforts to address community's concern. You know, Dr. Benjamin just said about how people are they're legitimately afraid or concerned. It's a fast approved uh, uh, vaccination, it's pretty new, and there might be safety concerns around that or, or other concerns, or maybe they lack information that's important for them. So by going and actually trying to, and they asked, you know, they said today, when you look and really on the data source they have, um, it's usually like surveys and social media. Those are the common uh, um, mechanism they have. But surveys and, and social media sometimes lack first in spatial and temporal granularity, right? Like most of the surveys being done are national surveys. But now if you are a local official, like what does that, you know, you have a national survey, but is my community behaving like, the, let's say the average American uh, uh, or the kind of, so that was a question of they didn't have local information. And w usually when they had something more of a local information, it was very poor on a temporal level, right? Like they have one survey done a few months ago and we know that the vaccination is something that is evolving so fast. So what was true you know, a few months ago might not be relevant anymore. Uh, when it comes to outside of just the granularity uh, uh, aspect, there's also, it's really resource intense takes them a lot of time and they are already extremely busy with just dealing with you know, distribution of the vaccination. So they don't have a lot of time to even run those surveys. And also surveys and social media has you know, a bunch of biases, right? Like uh, in social media, we hear that you know, most of the conversation in social media is really um, affected by a, a group of folks that are um, dominating the field. Maybe it's 10% of the actual users of social media that actually create most of the content. Right, so it's also very biased towards certain uh, uh, populations. So um, that was kind of the challenges we heard. And if they can get a more granular information, maybe less biased information, and without spending so much time, they can now kind of start inform the vaccination um, uh, confidence effort, right? They wanna uh, address people's concerns. They wanna tell them, oh, you should get vaccinated. And by knowing in their local region, really what's concerning people and how their region compared to other regions perhaps, they can you know, start targeting their efforts uh, to the right location. They can tailor the messaging and they can afterwards evaluate, is that is it making a difference, right? Like you, you put all this effort into an effort, this thing change over time. So that's what we heard. And then when it comes to, you know, when we think about now search, so people go, you know, when they seek information about many topics and especially on COVID-19 vaccination, 
usually they will go to Google search and they search for their question, for their concern. Uh, and many people are doing it. It's also something, you know, when you search, it's not something you're putting in social media, right, to the public to see. It's something that, you know, it's something that what bothers you. So it's a bit more representative, I would say, than like social media. And so when now on our side, we get millions of such queries from all around the US on what are people's concerns? What information are they seeking? So that kind of let them think, oh, maybe we can use really Google or Google Trends or the search, trends in search to really inform and provide this information that was lacking for public health officials and researchers in that space. Uh, so this is really what we, we went in and done, kind of trying to figure out how can we do it. Um, and then what, what we really done, we said, um, let's take all those searches. Now let's try to classify them to what, what information, what's the intent behind that search? What's the information need that they're trying to kind of convey uh, those searches? And now we aggregate them, we anonymize them. Uh, we state of the hard anonymization techniques and we offer those information per region and every week. So now you're gonna get these spatial and temporal trends in searches, or I would say maybe information you need around COVID-19 vaccination for every region. And you get those trends. Um, and those are obviously, as I mentioned, anonymized. So um, because we have so many searches, one unique thing really, and, and that again relates to the need that we've heard, there's so many searches now that we can really actually go very granular. So we are able to actually get to small counties and zip codes, not all zip codes in the US, but many zip codes, uh, and really can then get to a community, right? Like zip code, imagine a county like, um, let's say LA County, that's the biggest one in the US, it's 10 or 12 million people. So obviously it's very diverse. So we need to go to that level of zip code level to really bring understanding of what different communities in a given county even are thinking, what are information that they're seeking, and maybe their concerns. So for the first launch, what we've done is we've um, taken three high level categories. We have general interest in COVID-19 vaccination. This is kind of imagined parent category, or um, that is how, how much people are interested in COVID-19 vaccination. Then we had two subcategories that are, one is what we call vaccination intent. Those are searches that indicate interest in getting vaccinated. So early in the campaign, it was eligibility, like, am I eligible? Later on, it was, is it available in my region, right? When supply was limited. Uh, and then later on, it's really, where do I get vaccinated? That's uh, very common, right? CV, like a person searching for CVS pharmacy vaccination, a simple search query that indicates that he's probably looking to get vaccinated. So that was kind of the second category. And the third category is just broad safety and side effects. Those are searches that indicate people are concerned about this, I don't know, just concerned, are interested in the safety of the vaccination, what the side effects and maybe the symptoms associated with the vaccination. So those are the three high level categories that we had. Now, um, what we do, we're not reporting like absolute searches, like the, the absolute number of searches per region. What we do, we, we take the numbers of searches per category, right? Like number of searches for what we call vaccination intent. We divide it by overall searches on all topics in that specific region. Uh, and what we end up getting from that is the relative interest in that category in that region. And we do that every week now. And then you get those trends, right? Like, and because we're using this relative uh, thing like by dividing it to the overall search in that region, actually this relative interest is actually uh, comparable across regions. So you can take between different zip codes in a county, you can even take between counties in different states. All of those are completely comparable because it really talks about relative interest. I would say that we, we do multiply that relative interest by some factor across all of those regions, a single factor, just to make it, um, to move it to kind of a, a better numbers at scale between zero to 300 approximately, just to make the numbers easier to work with. Right. Um, and so this is really the methodology we, we're using. And, and I said, then public health officials, researchers, and potentially reporters can start looking at, you know, um, regional trends, national trends, and potentially, let's say, uh, from a reporting point of view, you can try and think, how, how does news cycles uh, um, affect uh, um, uh, people's searches and information needs? For example, when there's incentives in a given state, like you know, in Ohio or, or in uh, West Virginia, how is that affecting people searching to get vaccinated, this vaccination intent? Or maybe when the FDA has a new announcement around that now with the Johnson Johnson uh, uh, new uh, official um, side effect, how does that change how people search right now? Does that actually cause a surge in certain searches, maybe in certain regions? 
So this is some of the thoughts behind this uh, project and how we are hoping to help both public health officials, but in also potentially help with uh, uh, reporting as well about local communities. Okay, so I just want to make sure I understand this right. The three broad categories are safety, intent, and general interest? Yes. Okay, and then the 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 data are, the, the search terms are categorized and they're presented as relative interest. So not raw numbers, um, but we're, we're going to be able to see that that people in this region are are, are more interested in you know safety questions right now than people in another region. We're able to compare it that way. Correct, exactly. Um, okay. You'll be able to compare those uh, um, across each one of those categories, and even between the categories, by the way. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's uh, let's have a look at it, um, and uh, then we'll get to some other. Then we'll get to some questions. But uh, if you're able to sh you know pull it up and show it to yeah. us now. Yes, of course. Um, so. I'm hopeful that you can see it right now. So um, what yep, you're seeing can. right now is the dashboard. So um, the dashboard really like, is that like, there's a data that we're releasing. It's a data set you can download and use it. But there's also a dashboard you need to be able to explore the data and use it in, without kind of really touching the data directly. Um, so what you can see is we have really two type of views in the dashboard. We have the geospatial one, where right now it shows you know the US map and, and, and different counties. And you see the interest across different counties and states in a given category. As I said, there's the general one, vaccination intent, and safety and side effects. Um, we can also choose kind of the date, and we'll go through that in a, with an example in a second. You can also then scroll down, and you can see how things change over time. Right now, uh, because we're looking at the general United States, you can see the United States, the blue line, and then for each state, there's a line as well, and you can kind of assess how things are distributed over time and across regions as well. So we have that for each one of those categories as well. We also have some descriptions and, and uh, additional information for folks that are using it. So let me take an example. Let me go to vaccination intern searches, for example. Immediately, I guess, and you can see right now, this is the not this is not the last. I, I assume that maybe in a day or two we'll have updated data for the next, the week afterwards. But already here, you're seeing that there's a very different. Uh, um, distribution of intent to get vaccine right now in the US across different states, right? Like for example, West Virginia, Kentucky, Maine have relatively high interest in that space. And by the way, I don't know to explain that right now at the top of my head, there might be incentive program there. Um, let me show you, for example, let me go back to May. And that's because I, it's an area that I actually investigated. In the week of May 17 to May 23, we saw a huge spike in Ohio. And this is vaccination intent. This is a spike that indicates people looking to get vaccinated. So it searches like, where do I get vaccinated? Uh, uh, as I said, maybe a na name of a place and so forth. And you're seeing that Ohio is really unique in that space. And at that point, what happened really is that maybe in that week, maybe one or two days before that, there was the announcement of Vaccine Million, which was an incentive program that Ohio started at the state level to get people vaccinated. All of a sudden, there was this huge spike. That spike, by the way, continued on maybe to a lesser extent the week be, uh, uh, afterwards uh, um, as well. And in a similar way, when I kind of go to the temporal view of that, and now uh, um, let me actually. Um, so first, in the dashboard, you can obviously see between different counties, and let me go one tab before that, between different uh, uh, the different counties in Ohio, the differences. I would say that the dashboard, you know, the colors doesn't allow us to show the, the full scope, but uh, of, of ranges of numbers. But you can obviously, uh, uh, there was an increase in everyone, but not necessarily in the same way in every county. Um, and then when I go to the time series, you can immediately see this spike here in the time series around May 17, where all of a sudden all counties had this spike. But clearly there was a very diff, diff, there was a big difference between different counties. So actually that uh, campaign did not affect all counties in a similar way. So you can see that, for example, in the data. Um, and I would say another thing is right now the dashboard, and I'd say it does not yet include the zip code level data, just the dashboard. The data itself that you can download does include that, and we're hoping to add that capability to the dashboard in the next few weeks. Um, another thing that is interesting, for example, you'll see that during uh, March 8 and March 15, that was the main time when a lot of people really got vaccinated. That was kind of when things started opening up in different states and different dates, but got open up and you can see that if you look at safety and side effects you see the spike approximately two weeks afterwards you see the spike and when we looked at that we, we saw that actually what happens is people are setting up their appointment 
And then afterward, just before they get vaccinated or shortly after, they feel the side effects, right? Like maybe it's uh, uh, a bit of fever, maybe it's uh, uh, fatigue and so forth. And people then start searching about it. So across the country, I would say, we see that effect of people really interested specifically in the symptoms shortly afterward, after probably probably experienced them or, uh, uh, or maybe interested just before the vaccination. So this is kind of a, um, just an example of how, you know, in the regional level, there's an option for kind of reporting and understanding really what's going on and how different countries and soon enough through the dashboard, how different zip codes react to a vaccination uh, um, incentive program. Uh, so this is, I think, kind of the main features of the dashboard. I would say that outside of adding zip codes to the dashboard, there's other improvements that we're going to add, like making it easier to compare between regions. And we're also thinking about, you know, we heard from public health officials that, you know, this is three high level categories, but there is interest in going deeper, maybe what the specific safety concerns people have. So we are right now working on seeing how can we bring more clarity, more detail, or more granular uh, categories that give more sense of what people are really concerned on and, and the different counties, states, and so forth. So this is a thing that is coming uh, uh, hopefully soon as well. Okay, I have a question here from uh, Juliet Beverly, who is a um, who is a former fellow of ours. She's from brainfacts.org. Uh, are the insights in real time or over the past year? I mean, is, is it just the last week or is it cumulative? Oh. So um, we are providing, every week we provide a new data update that indicates what happened this last week. You do have all the historical data right now, starting from January, uh, the first week of January, 2021. We hope to maybe even increase that a bit uh, uh, earlier than that. Um, so I would say the insects themselves or the data itself is week by week, but I would say that a lot of the insights might actually be more of a cumulative insights, right? Like how does a, a given country uh, or, you know, comparing different countries and how they behave over time, right? Like, or maybe different states um, based on the characteristics of those states or counties, like maybe some had bigger spike early on uh, because there was a lot of people that were eager to get vaccinated. So many were searching first for vaccination intent. And then, you know, it's dwindled down after many of them got vaccinated. And some places had like a very light spike and it's kind of maybe continues on, but not, not, you know, in not a high rate, for example. So there is interesting thing in actually reviewing the overall data, probably, and, you know, I'm talking uh, from, you know, the light exploration we've done. Um, uh, but right now the data itself is focused on a week by week, uh, which is comparable, you know, across time. Okay, so uh, one of just FYI, uh, uh, one of the one of our viewers, Michael Pittman, a reporter for the Journal News in Ohio, says that Kentucky's spike right now, which we saw when you first pulled the map up, is for Kentucky's uh, incentive program. Um, so, uh, one final question, then we'll move to Dr. Weintraub. If you could tell us a little bit about how um, talk about Google's privacy protections, how uh, you know, you know, are are people seeing individual searches? Are people able to see what individual people are searching on? And how, and so can you describe that for us? Uh, so no, uh, um, from privacy point of view, you know, every, all the data we're putting out there right now, and right now it's really those trends, those um, relative interest numbers. There's no information or any indication of any personal search by a person. Um, so it's completely anonymized. When we're thinking about more detailed topics, or even when what we hear kind of as a feedback from public health officials is, if we can help them contextualize some of this information, but maybe providing like imagine sample queries. So imagine a kind of popular queries that indicate, oh, what is it really when we're saying safety and side effect? What is it vaccination intent? And as it changes over time, right? Because we said early on, maybe it was eligibility, and now it's maybe where do I get vaccinated? So we are trying to see how we bring some of this queries or sample queries in that, but again, everything we'll be putting out there will have, um, you know, we'll pass anonymization bars that are very, very strict to make sure there's no impact on privacy. Okay. Well, let's move on to the um, other tool, uh, which is, uh, was developed by um, Rebecca Weintraub. She's with Harvard, Harvard Medical School and um, Arianda Labs. Um, so, uh, this it's the vaccine equity tool. It it come it uses Google data, so you're working on it with Google. So, Dr. Weintraub, if you could maybe you know give us the the overview of 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 the vaccine equity tool, and then show how reporters can use it. 
Sure, please do. So many thanks for having me and great to be here with Dr. Benjamin and my colleague Tomer. First, just want to start off, this is a collective effort. Um, and I think just to remind us in the midst of an emergency, when you find incredible colleagues, which we have at Boston Children's Hospital with Google Health and our team at Ariadne Labs, we've been able to bring together a quite unusual set of players and most importantly, to be honest, under the advice of state and local planners. And so we've been on the phone um, since early um, in the pandemic um, with our public planners who've been responsible for managing shelter in place, remote schooling, masking, testing, and now vaccination. And I think what we're seeing once again, unfortunately, is a chronic underinvestment in public health. And we are here to develop mm -hmm. a set of tools to help uh, manage the uncertainty. Uh, next slide, please. So just two comments, Chris, of kind of why we decided to build this tool. First, if we think about early on the pandemic, we sent a message that we would be distributing the vaccine via mass vaccination sites, retail pharmacy, for example. And our primary care providers, when surveyed, said they were ready and willing and eager to distribute the vaccine, but there was not supply made available in December 2020. And one reason for that is we are concerned about thermal stability and shelf life, which we now know is not a barrier for primary care providers. The, the mRNA vaccines can remain in a refrigerator for 30 days up to 90 days, um, depending on which one you're speaking to. And um, our colleague at the African American Research Collaborative did a, a striking poll in June of this year, where they asked the unvaccinated individuals, would you prefer to receive a vaccine and where would you like to go? And you can see the overwhelming column on the left is at my doctor's office. Now we know not everyone can access a physician's office, but we are seeing a rise in people re-entering and um, going back to their outpatient providers, their subspecialist providers, um, but they themselves may not have access to the vaccine. And just wanted to um, reinforce Dr. Benjamin's point about primary care providers and subspecialist providers being that trusted messenger people are returning and resuming that type of care. And also the importance, for example, of receiving that second mRNA vaccine shot to fend off the Delta variant, which we know is vital for vaccine efficacy. And the third point, I think if we look at our global colleagues that we know the vaccine distribution in the UK, in Europe, in East Asia, much of it has been done through primary care practices and they've been the backbone for accelerating vaccination in the midst of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So just to walk us through quickly um, why we built this tool. This is kind of the money slide for the reporters on the call. What were we able to evaluate here is that geographic access still matters. We have not distributed the vaccine to all those who intend to receive the vaccine and are unvaccinated. So currently we have 17 million eligible folks who live in a rural vaccine desert, 50 million people who live in an urban vaccine del uh, desert, um, and with all, already the denominator being over 100 million people are eligible but still have not received uh, their first shot. And so the tool helps you then detect where the vaccination sites I should consider opening in my vaccine desert, which include 800 primary care health centers, a thousand federally qualified health centers that have been absolutely stellar in getting to um, communities that have not been able to access a provider during this time. And if you're looking for additional sites, for example, there's 1,200 local pharmacies, retail stores, for example, places of worship you may consider as, as you think about your planning ahead. Next slide, please. So the Vaccine Equity Planner helps you first detect the vaccine desert. So the black dots there are the vaccine distribution points and the Google Health team were able to then assess the catchment area regarding each vaccine distribution point and the shaded area then is the desert where an individual would have to travel by foot, by car, by public transportation. And then we help you identify the potential sites in the desert. Next slide, please. So you can do the following when you walk through the vaccine equity planner. Um, after mapping the vaccine deserts, you can display the counties by the CDC social vulnerability index. You can then shade the counties by the number of people who intend to be vaccinated, but aren't yet. Then you can change your definition of a vaccine desert, depending if you're in urban or rural area, for example, driving, walking, public transportation. You can display the potential sites within the deserts. And then you can see the download data button in the left-hand bottom corner. You can then actually download the information if you'd like to have a list, for example, if you're thinking about outreach directly to the sites, or should I place mobile vans in these areas? 
um, for further assess assessment. Next slide, please. So an example here in Alabama, you see the shaded areas, high social vulnerability index county, the large areas that are shaded, unfortunately, are within a vaccine desert. Um, the good news is that we're able to detect the Clayton Family Health Center. Um, the address is located um, and you're able to then, next slide please, hit the link um, and then you actually pop up the information from Google Maps about the Clayton Family Health Center for active outreach to that site. Next slide please. Um, and just in the example, we've had dozens of states reach out to us to explain to us the use case um, how, how they've used the vaccine equity planner. Here's an example from Jim Craig in Mississippi who displayed it in the midst um, of a press conference he was giving um, at, at the end of June, explaining the complexity and why they needed to mitigate these vaccine deserts. And he would continue following um, the changes in the deserts over time. Next slide, please. And just as a reminder, just as Tomer mentioned regarding the first tool, this in addition, we'll be updating this every week. So we go back to assess where are the vaccine sites active? What are the shape and changes to the deserts? So you can see it's dated um, June 17th on the left-hand side to June 23rd. Um, and basically there's more white on June 23rd, which means new sites were open and the deserts being mitigated over time by the changes in site location, um, for example, in between um, Tuscaloosa uh, and, and Birmingham. Um, as well. Next slide, please. And just want to kind of end, there's future use cases that we're thinking about and eager for your input. Um, folks who are on the ground or journalists who are assessing, gosh, we need to plan ahead for X. So we're in conversation with local and state folks, for example, about pediatric access to the COVID-19 vaccine, knowing how the effect of the pandemic on our general pediatricians um, and this is in a sense a prototype of what will be built um, for pediatric access to show potential vaccination sites, redefine the deserts, and then shade the counties by the number of children in that area. Um, so Chris, we'll send it back to you and looking forward to questions and discussion. Okay, so just a couple of questions on the, um, on the sites. The, the sites, are you on a, on a weekly basis, are you getting updated information from from state or county health departments about where the vaccination sites are in their jurisdiction. And that's updated every week. Is that what you said? Well, uh, just to take a step back, Chris. So the vaccine active sites are aggregated by Vaccine Finder. So that's Boston Children's Hospital that became vaccines.gov. So okay. that's the back end of all the sites that are registered with vaccines.gov. And those sites are then, in a sense, become, they do change each week. Um, but it depends on the reporting of the site to vaccines.gov. Okay. And you also mentioned the CDC's social vulnerab vulnerability index. Could you describe that for me a little bit? I mean, I mean, I'm just thinking that might be a tool that journalists could use. So this is a long-standing contract by the CDC to understand vulnerability even prior to the pandemic. So what makes one community vulnerable? Um, in the midst of a shock to the system. So it's been adapted, it, it's been, um, it's a structured way and index to understand vulnerability and then it's been applied in the pandemic. So we followed how the states um, have used the social vulnerability index to assess which county is in need. Um, oh, thank you, someone's pulled it up as we're speaking. Yeah, okay. Um, now, before we, uh, we'll have some questions from the audience, but I wanted to, you also were involved with, um, Earlier in, in the pandemic, you were involved with something called the Vaccine Allocation Planner. I was hoping you could describe that for me, and, if, and if, uh, Alyssa, our producer, could pull up the, the New York Times story that kind of used it. Can you maybe describe for us what the Vaccine Allocation Planner was and then how journalists used it? Sure, please do. So in um, collaboration with Sergo Ventures, we built the Vaccine Allocation Planner to help a state or local leader understand the population estimates of how they would manage vaccine scarcity. So if we remember back to November, states were asked to submit a playbook to the CDC. What would be the order of populations they would first serve because they'd be distributing the vaccine in the midst of the pandemic? So who would they protect first? And the first framework was developed by the National Academies for Science, Engineering, and Medicine. 
And we took that framework and created a tool to help the state and local planner understand the population estimates, the number of doses they would receive to cover that population. Um, and then the Center for Disease Control created its additional framework um, from the ACIP committee. So there are basically two different ways that direction states were given to think about the early rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine in the midst of the pandemic and we helped the states and local planners adapt that. And then what happened was um, journalists, for example, um, like the opinion section of the New York Times, uh, reached out and said, this data asset's quite interesting and we're, we would like to use it to communicate to the general public about where and why they will need to wait for a vaccine. So if we remember back to the first and second week of December, it was clear that individuals would be waiting on a vaccine line as healthcare providers, for example, long-term care providers, um, and those in long-term care facilities would be receiving the vaccine dose. So Stuart Thompson and his team then laid out this illustration to give folks a sense of where you'd be on the vaccine line and really to promote empathy and patience in the midst of vaccine scarcity. Okay, so let's um, move on to some general questions. Uh, uh, viewers, you can either put a question in Q&A or raise your Zoom hand. Um, Juliet Beverly, I see your hand up. Have you just got, have you already gotten your question answered or do you still have the question? I still have the question. Okay, Juliet Beverly is from brainfacts.org and a, a former NPF fellow. So uh, floor is yours, Juliet. Thanks. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, my name is Juliet Beverly. I'm the senior editor for brainfacts.org. Um, my question is for um, uh, Tomer and it, it's really about what the algorithm is collecting in terms of insights into vernacular and perhaps sentence structure um, in differentiating perhaps who's looking for what and how, and maybe that can lead to insights into messaging for communities. Um, also, I, I would like to ask Dr. Benjamin, um, you know, is it possible that a percentage of messaging to communities should actually just also be talking about how science is done, rather how a vaccine comes to be, um, instead of just focusing on what the vaccine does. Thanks. Yeah, let me, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I sit on the Board of Research America, and one of the things that we have discovered is that um, most people in most communities, in, until they discovered Tony Fauci, could not name a single living scientist um, <laughs> or where science is done in their community. Uh, and the fact that it's done right up the street at um, some university, they don't see that as necessarily a science. So yes, we do need to do a broader um, literacy, um, science understanding discussion in our nation so that people knows who scientists are, where they come from, the fact that they're your neighbors, what do they do and how they do it, and particularly the fact that the scientific method is one where someone has an idea, they test it, they find all the things that don't work, that's, that's, that's good science, but they also find out what does work. Then they publish it, sometimes the good stuff that works, sometimes the stuff that doesn't work, and then that is tested by other people, and that it's an iterative process until we get to what we believe is a preponderance of an understanding, which we then call facts. And people don't know that. And they also don't realize that over time, our understanding of information will become better. Uh, and when that happens, the advice that people that use that evidence or that science give you might change. I.e. mass were the great example of where the science and our understanding, or as our understanding of the facts changed over time and therefore the advice changed. Okay, thank you. And, and, and uh, uh, Tomer? Uh, so if I understand correctly the question, um, uh, I, I think my understanding was that based on who is doing the search, there was a question, can that, for example, um, provide even further insights? So I would say I, I clearly see how maybe demographics to some extent, by who I assume the kind of more demographics aspect can be useful. Uh, we in our team in general, we are not um, adding, or we are unable to add any demographics aspect to the type of analysis we're doing. The data is not available. 
Um, so we're not doing any kind of demographic assessment of, let's say, those trends are specifically within a given demographics. We do hope that um, the, the users, whether it's researchers, public health officials, they have access to publicly available demographic data about different counties or zip codes. We'll be able to combine this information, our information, along with uh, um, this kind of publicly available information, to kind of come up maybe with insights about how different demographics affect search patterns. So this is something that can be uh, very interesting and we expect to have a lot of research done externally on this topic, uh, but it's not something we are able to do directly ourselves. Okay, so thanks. Uh, I have a question here uh, for Dr. Weintraub. This is also from Juliet Beverly. Uh, Dr. Weintraub, can we assume that areas where we see a vac uh, vaccine desert, we also see a historic historical healthcare disparity? That, that's an excellent question. We need to study this longitudinally over time. Remember, this is a snapshot of an active vaccine site, but we are concerned. We're also concerned if you think about the economic uncertainty that uh, primary care providers have faced in the midst of the pandemic, the loss of revenue. Um, will we actually, it's not only access to the vaccine, but it will be access to a primary care provider over time. More to come. Okay. Um, and just an update, um, I see some people, uh, we've, we've put the links to these two particular um, tools in the chat, um, but after this program, later on today or tomorrow, we'll also post a list of, of other resources, including, um, I mean, including these, these two tools, including the American Public Health Association and Dr., some of Dr. Benjamin's uh, speeches and testimony, and just you know, a lot of other res CDC resources, a lot of other you know vaccine planner tools that you could have. So we have a few more minutes. If anybody else has a question out there, um, just raise your hand uh, and ask an audio question or submit it in chat. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Benjamin another question dealing with vaccine uptake by race. Um, Alyssa, if you could pull up slide 15. This is uh, these are data from the Kaiser Family Foundation that's showing uh, while there has been, uh, this is dealing uh, vaccine uptake by race, it's showing that there has been some narrowing among racial groups, but disparities persist. Less than half of Black and Hispanic people have received at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose in nearly all states that were reporting data, and I believe this is 40 states. Um, and so do you expect these lines to continue to go up and to narrow, or have we have we reached a plateau? Well, you know, I'm, I'm always hopeful that they will go up. Um, I, you know, the challenge is in terms of trying to reduce those disparities um, remains a real, a real challenge uh, over time. The um, access to structural barriers um, continue to be, to be present. Um, you know, a lot of the people that we want to now vaccinate, um, particularly in, in African-American and Hispanic communities, tend to be more hard to reach. Um, and we haven't even begun talking about, you know, getting people that are in conjugate settings, you know, dis disabled um, people in prisons, um, all of those things are gonna ultimately impact those numbers as well. So those disparities may persist for a while longer. And in fact, let me just say that we were very successful with intention and focus in getting rid of those gaps in childhood vaccinations. So we know we can do it. It just requires a lot of effort. Okay. Um, so uh, just to, I was hoping I could maybe toss this to all three of you, but just what are the ways that people, you know, the general population can investigate and protect themselves from vaccine misinformation? I mean, if, if somebody wants to explore something that they heard on the street or they saw on social media, are there particular resources that you would, um, you would turn them to? Uh, unless, of course, we just want everybody to talk to, call Dr. Benjamin directly. Are you, are you open to those calls? Well, you know, I'll take anyone's call if they really need to talk to me. I'm certainly reporters, but let me have let me say that um, we work with the Ad Council, uh, and we have a website called GetVaccineAnswers.org, all one word: GetVaccineAnswers.org. And for for the average citizen, the answers that um, that are there um, basically get most of the, the the questions that most people have. 
I think the second thing that people can do, of course, is go to the CDC website or the World Health Organization website. WHO website is a little more difficult to navigate. Uh, CDC has a lot of information. Sometimes it, it's not uh, um, easy to find, uh, but um, getvaccineanswers.org um, was designed for, for public consumption much more so than, than some of these other sites. But um, I, I would encourage people to go to certainly those three sites. There's information on the APHA website as well, but in most cases we link back to other trusted messengers like the CDC um, um, and the, um, the World Health Organization. Okay, uh, Dr. Weintraub? I just, thank you, Dr. Benjamin. I just would also would add the data is quite compelling that employers have also become a trusted channel. And kudos to all the heads of HR and employment assistance programs who've taken leadership roles during this time. It's been tremendous to work with them and to realize they are also not only coming through and curating that for their workforce, but reminding folks, we want you to, to return to work healthy. We want to, you to help you bridge back to preventative health beyond COVID-19, obviously, to resume your outpatient providers, preventative health. Um, and I think employers are going to play a tremendous role, independent of the vaccine being mandated versus access to testing, but truly as this bridge to wellness. Um, and all the dimensions of wellness that we need to resume as we return to work. Okay. Uh, and before we leave you, Dr. Weintraub, tell our audience uh, again, what's, what's, what's your backdrop there? Oh, so this is a cell micrograph um, and it's colored uh, by an artist. <laughs> yeah, very cool, very cool. So Tomer, any, other, any uh, tools that uh, uh, the public in general or journal specifically can use to kind of explore misinformation and try to find the right information? Um, well, I, I think I'll mostly keep it for Dr. Benjamin and Dr. Weintraub to answer that, being uh, more of a public health uh, experts versus me. I would say that Google is doing uh, a lot of work to make sure that when you do search for information, whether it's on search or on YouTube, you will get the links to authoritative sources, whether the CDC, local health department, and others, to make sure that uh, you have good authoritative sources immediately available if you do go to our, our services and, and products. Okay, and well, let me, um, let me, I have one final question. Um, I'll, I'll throw it to the two MDs on the panel here, although it might be more of a question for psychologists than, than medical doctors. But do people want to be protected from misinformation or at this stage of the game, are people, have people picked their team and they're not, logical from that. Do you either have either of you have a, a view on that? Rebecca, you want to take that one first? Or you want me to <laughs> have an opinion? Uh, you, you start Dr. Benjamin. Yeah, I, I think I think people want the right information. And I think that that even people who are living in the ecosystem where they're getting a lot of bad information, in general, they know they're getting they're getting bad information. I, I think that the concern that people have is how how people consume risk. And human beings are very, very terrible about um, understanding risk. We just are, we're just, we're just made that way. And so to the extent that we can give people the right information um, and raise their concern without scaring them to death, um, I think this is the goal of public health. And so um, I think if you just simply continue to give them the information, um, you know, they say, if you, don't, you hear something seven times, you'll, you'll stick. Uh, we just need to continue to give them the right information. And by the way, understand that there, we have two worlds in this country. We have people that are seeing people die every day and get real sick with COVID and people that aren't seeing it. Once those communities start seeing it, they're going to believe it's real. Okay. And Dr. Weintraub, any final thoughts? Yeah. No, just thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things we're concerned about with the Delta variant is that our young unvaccinated individuals are not only more risk of transmission, but of severe disease and death. And I think Dr. Benjamin's point, when people start seeing their friend, their work colleague, unfortunately fall ill um, or die, I think that's when people will start in a sense saying, gosh, this is actually, I didn't realize this is different than December when I was thinking about this moment of the pandemic was actually protecting my elder. And we have to remember this is what's gonna happen with variants and there'll be additional variants to come. 
Um, so the consistent messenger will not only need to be our, the local provider, but honestly your local community, your local influencer, um, which is gonna be your neighbor, your colleague, your friend. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And, and Dr. George Benjamin, Tomer Sheckel, and Dr. Rebecca Weintraub, thank you all for lending your expertise and your time for our session here today. Thank you.